Happy casual wanky Wednesday. Oh, I managed not to spill on myself. <laughs> I win. It's Wednesday and I'm whining. You're already whining and winning. I don't know. That was terrible. That was terrible. <laughs> that was terrible. Hi, Brandon. Hey, Amanda. Welcome to the Casual Wine Geeks. Um, Thanks for joining us we're today. We're geeking and, and casually talking about... Wine. Well, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> The things surrounding wine. We're talking about why you're the Chianti to my heart. Oh, you have the Chianti to my heart. Yeah, we're talking about Chianti today. <laughs> and this time, two years ago, we were in Italy together. We were drinking Chianti. Mm-hmm. I saw those photos. Oh, in my Tuscany. God. Yeah, two years ago, we were in Tuscany. Oh, the in a food. Villa. Oh, the food. The food and the wine and the... Oh. All the things. Here's the tip. What's the t- just the tip? A tip in life. Okay. Go to Italy, look up Nona Anna, go on one of her tours, and drink wine the whole way. Oh, yeah. She's super knowledgeable about everything. Everything. And yeah. the wine is delicious, and the food is amazing, and we had rabbit nuggets. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, when we were in Florence. Oh, we also got to go to the Galileo Museum, which was mm. pretty fantastic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we saw his thumb and his Two fingers. It was two fingers. Yeah, we saw three fingers. And some teeth. Of Galileo. That yeah. was incredible. <laughs> like the first telescopes and old, like there mm-hmm. was a whole medical equipment area, which was weird and torture devicey, but. That was weird and torture devicey, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was a cool museum. But today we're talking about Chianti. Yeah, Chianti is really fun. So I feel like it gets a bad <laughs> rap because of uh, Silence of the Lambs. Oh, right. Oh, do you have any information about why he said that line? I don't. Do you? Yeah. Well, oh. I know why. Oh, tell me. Because um, if you have, there's some sort of chemical in Chianti and lima beans. What what it was the line? Fava beans. Fava beans. There's a chemical that interacts with um, antipsychotics. So he's basically saying that I'm not on my psychotic medication anymore. What? Yeah, it's so crazy. Is that true? It was like one of those m- movie detail myths you know you like read all the details of why so if you're drinking chianti and eating fava beans is it supposed to act like a like medication i don't understand it it negates the so if you were taking antipsychotics and you had fava beans which i'm not for the record (laughs) right and you were drinking fava beans and or drinking chianti and eating fava beans it would negate the effectiveness of your antipsychotics really yeah that was the whole so that was the whole why the whole reason why he said that line apparently according to the internet and we all know that everything on the internet is true huh yeah so he was basically saying i'm not on my psychotic medic like i'm not on antipsychotics i didn't anymore. read the silence of the lambs but i read a couple of his other books so i don't know if that was like pulled out of the book or if that uh, was part of the maybe. movie i read red dragon and it was too much and i'm a king a stephen king fan so but it was a little too much for me. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah. Anyway, Chianti. Chianti Classico. Yeah. What did you bring? You brought something delicious. I did bring something delicious. I knew we were doing Chianti today. And um, this is a 2011, which is kind of old. And I I think it's showing really well. Uh, Chianti Classico Reserva. This will probably be really tasty tomorrow. Yeah. Like after it's been open for half a day. Yeah. Or a day. Or I was whatever. like, yeah, let's open this because then I can have it all weekend. I can taste through it for oh, the next for sure. like, three days. Oh, for sure. Right? And that's a nice thing I like about Chianti is that it, um, and a lot of wines from that area, Montalcino and, mm-hmm. and whatnot, um, I feel like their wines are that really big, beefy structure. Yeah. We'll talk about that when we talk about Super Tuscans. Oh, yeah. That's what That's we're right. mm-hmm, on the agenda. Trying to keep to a <laughs> trying to keep to a list. We're trying to keep to a list. Yeah, we were going to talk about uh, Chianti Chianti Classico and why. Um, what's the word? Why? Why it's called that? Like oh, what the what the regulation is for a Chianti? Or oh, Chianti yeah. Classico? So this is a Classico Reserva, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a DOC. G, G. Uh, which just means that it has to adhere to a certain set of rules. And Chianti can get a little confusing because there's a lot of layers because there are certain areas that get their own fancy pants designation. Kind of like Burgundy a little bit, but like not really. Like Champagne? Uh, no, uh, we'll get there. Okay. There's a map that is helpful. <laughs> um, the map can be found on Patreon. <laughs> uh, so 
first of all, just like general Chianti, let's just break that up. Um, Chianti is Sangiovese, is the grape mm-hmm. in Tuscany, in this area of Italy. Uh, and you can find Sangiovese in different parts of Italy, but if it's classified as Chianti, it's Sangiovese. Yes, correct. Uh, you'll also see it in Brunello, uh, uh, Mont- Montepulciano will have it. Um, but if you're just doing Chianti, it's just Sangiovese. So what that means, in you'll see um, sort of generic Chianti around, and that's going to be uh, 75% Sangiovese, right? Mm-hmm. So it has to be 75% just to be Chianti. Um, you can sometimes see some white blended in. Um, it's not it's not that crazy. They do it in their own. Uh, oh, to blend. Mm-hmm. You're just, I think we talked about it a little bit on the Merlot episode, right? For like, sure, for sure. Yeah, for where sure. You can like different designations can have different amounts. Yeah. And so it has to have a minimum alcohol content of 11 and a half percent. And oh, interesting. Mm-hmm, the harvest, the harvest yields are restricted to four tons an acre. So you can only harvest a certain amount per acre per acre. That's very much like champagne as well. Yeah. Yeah. So then you move up into Chianti Classico. Uh, so that is where you'll start seeing. Oh, this is the other thing we're talking about is the Black Rooster. Oh, yeah. The mm-hmm. Black Rooster. So this is where you start seeing the Black Rooster on the neck of the bottle. Mm-hmm. Uh, that means that um, there's this conglomeration of Chianti producers who have set up this consortium, Chianti Classico. And what they do is they regulate the do's and don'ts to be able to call your wine this thing. They're the, they're the Chianti Classico syndicate. Well, it's the consortium, but syndicate makes it sound so <laughs> sinister, like they're super villains. Yeah, it's like the champagne syndicate where they. Well, that's a little bit more legit because <laughs> they'll break a bottle and then cut you with it, all in like a impeccable French suit. Yeah, but it's the it's the Chianti Classico syndicate, and if you abide by their rules, you get a black rooster, right? I mean, basically. Mm-hmm. Yep. So up there, it's different. The minimum percentage for Sangiovese is 80%. You have to have 80% minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can only use red grapes versus regular Chianti. Sometimes white grapes are allowed to be blended in. White Sangiovese or white grapes? Uh, of any sort other of? things, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so for this one, so only red grapes. Uh, mm-hmm. However, you have the option of making it 100% Sangiovese if you want. Oh, you still so have an option. It, yeah, it doesn't have to be a blend. Um, alcohol content has to be 12%, and the wine has to spend at least 12 months in oak barrels. Uh, the Chianti Classico region itself actually covers an area of about 100 square miles, and the grape harvest can be no more than three tons per acre. So Less tonnage. Less tonnage. So it's much like Spanish wine. Uh, Spanish... Oh, God. Spanish, um, the Spanish wine system where... Oh, Riojas? Riojas, yeah. yeah. Much like Riojas, sorry. <laughs> like my brain is not connected to my mouth. Because uh, Riojas have a very similar, you have to have this much oak, you have to pick only X amount of grapes, you have to... Mm-hmm. It's very I mean, it's like that everywhere. County it's, Classico, you know. To have a, a designation. Yeah, because it keeps it stylistically... <coughs> excuse me, stylistically the style mm-hmm. of that food. We should do a Rioja day. Okay. <laughs> I love Spanish wine. I drink it all the time. Yeah, that was on our list actually for 2018. Was and to they drink love more Spanish some Spanish. Wine. Or they love American oak. Gives that yeah. real nice toasty coconut. Anyway, sidebar. So moving up one more level after uh, Canto Classico, then you have Classico Reserva, which is what we're drinking. Which is what we're drinking. Yeah. So this is... So like, you started with the best is what you're saying. Yeah, well, because you deserve it. God damn it. <laughs> So do I. Uh, so Reserva is um, not just for things like Brunello or Barolo. You for it's hard. So for Chianti, Reserva means that it gets um, two years in oak okay. and then three months bottle aging. Alcohol content must be at least twelve and a half percent. Chianti Reserva. Um, really good for bottling like bottle aging like every time lay it down every level the alcohol volume or the alcohol by volume goes up mm-hmm. so it's like eight twelve twelve and a half yeah yeah interesting this is really good actually i'm not surprised but do they have any um restrictions on oak content or oak um like what kind of oak whether it's german or hungarian or i don't think so 
I think it just has to see oak. I don't think that it's, and that's not a bit that I found when I was doing any of the research. So I don't know if it, um, interesting would be, Oh, this has a nice sour cherry. Mm, this is delicious. Wait, are we drinking this now? No, we're drinking. I, I poured some of this into my old class, but not mine. Mine's Mm-mm. still that. Okay. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what are we drinking? What's happening right now? What's going on? Yeah. This Who's is the reserve. This not I. It uh, had the black rooster on it. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the black rooster. So that I feel like is a really iconic thing when you think of Chianti. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of, it's sort of their um, seal of approval, I yeah. guess is a way that you could talk about it. And also a mascot. It's like on all their marketing material. It's on all their, you know, it's a, you can buy black rooster bags in Florence. Oh yeah. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's, yeah. and it's one of those like seal of approvals. Mm-hmm. I can't think of something like that in the States that we have. No, I don't think so. That's so interesting. But this is also from an area where in Europe, like every noble house had like an image that represented them, right? Yeah, that's true. You had families, crests and flags and duchies and, Mm -hmm. you know, Italy was not always one united thing. You know, it used to be kingdoms and fiefdoms. What the fuck ever's. Every time we drink um, Chianti in any form, I think of being in Florence. The rabbit nuggets, the felsina, the little, you know, cruising around and, but mm-hmm. we weren't really in, I mean, we were kind of, but we went to Tuscany after Florence. Well, Florence is in Tuscany. So well, we were just in the countryside. To, yeah. We went to the countryside. That's what I meant at a villa. When we were in the villa. Yeah. Yeah. Very so, fancy villa. Yeah. So that was what was interesting. So what's interesting about this whole like black rooster situation is, um, in talking about that like when things were not united you had florence which was Mm -hmm. its own little kingdom yep and then siena south just south which was Mm -hmm. also its own little kingdom and they were constantly going back and forth and uh what ended up happening was apparently whether this is you know this is from the internet (laughs) yes yes but your sources are cited uh yeah i always cite my sources because I don't need someone coming after me for fucking fraud or plagiarism. <laughs> so Florence in the fr- Florence in the top. Mm-hmm. Siena. Yep. Countryside. Yep. So there's about a hundred miles between Florence and Siena, and the regions back then, which was probably about eight hundred years ago, um, there was a lot of like feuding going on over the territories, and so everybody wanted more land than they had take this thing and take that thing and so like you know the areas were kind of constantly changing and so it ends up that they decide okay well here's how we're gonna get like official established borders Mm -hmm. i was looking where sienna was on a map oh gotcha i will have a map up for people so it is i was trying to find rome oh yeah, it's like a not a, not even a quarter of the way south of Florence to Rome. And on the train, it took two hours. Yeah, like no time at all. Yeah, so it's really not far at all away from Florence. Yeah, it's about 100 miles. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. That, yep. Crazy. Uh, okay, so back to the story. <laughs> so we're fighting, we're arguing. I want this, I want that land. Yep. Uh, okay, here's, what, here's what we're going to do. There's, gonna, there's this road... And you're going to pick a guy on a horse and yep. we're going to pick a guy on a horse. Yep. And where they meet on the road is where we'll draw the line between us and you. Oh, so like it's a hundred miles or however long, hundred yep. kilometers yep. from, from a starting place to a starting place. And then where we meet in the middle is where we'll define. So they have to get the fastest horse to get well, the most land. Here's where it gets interesting and why it's a black rooster. Uh, as legend has it, each city would send a rider at the crack of dawn into the territory and where they would meet up would be the boundary between the two cities. So this, the horsemen essentially having to rely on roosters to wake them up in the morning. Oh, yeah. So Sienna picked a white rooster and fattened it up thinking that it would wake him earlier. Uh Uh-huh. But when you're actually full of food, you'll sleep longer versus if you're hungry, (laughs) it's more of a like driving force to wake you up. Yeah. Right. 
I've 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 been awoken by my tummy. And in the so of the night. Yes. Florence picked a black rooster and kind of starved him a little bit in hopes oh. that like he would wake up earlier and start asking for food, mm-hmm. which would then in turn wake the horse rider up earlier, so he would get a better head start on. That's such an getting interesting farther story. down the road, so yeah. that the guy from Siena wouldn't get as far, and then Florence would get more land. And so then, so the black rooster won. The black, well, yes, <laughs> as it is a black rooster on the neck of this bottle of Gabbiano. That's the next one. Yeah, I brought a Chianti Classico from Gabbiano. So, uh, so, so the rooster, the black rooster, was in Florence. The rider from Florence was getting farther and where they were meeting was farther away from Florence. So Siena was getting smaller as Florence was growing. Correct. Right. And so like there's arguments about how far each person got. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some people say that the, the writer from Siena didn't get as far as even like 12 kilometers outside the city before. Oh really? (laughs) Dude. Uh, -uh. (laughs) um, that makes me so yeah. That's so, but it's just you know one of those like yeah. oh, it's a cute history. Yeah, you know, I love those stories. Funny thing, uh, yeah. So the rooster was adopted as the official emblem by the League of Chianti in 1384. Wow! And was officially adopted by the Chianti Classic Wine Consortium in 2005, which is why you see the little rooster on the neck of a Chianti Classico. Now, if it is surrounded by a red circle, it's a straight up Chianti Classico. If there's a gold circle that means it's a reserva huh interesting really because that i don't know what that is it looks like a red but it says a reserva yeah i don't know i don't know yeah interesting yeah so that's a fun little and it's usually on the capsule and we threw the capsules away yeah (laughs) womp womp quesera we're doing chianti classico not sera today i know it was a bad joke it doesn't show anything. Oh, well. It's just like... It's n- neither here nor there. Neither here nor there. I'm very excited about this Gabbiano. Yeah, so we actually got we to go to Gabbiano. And yes. so this was like 10 bucks at the grocery store. Good mm-hmm. Canto Classico, uh, 2015. Ca- Castillo de Gabbiano. We, we c- actually, you know what we have? I think we have some pictures. Do you have pictures? We'll put them up on yeah, Instagram probably. or something. And that was one of the first places that I saw uh, they would plant rose bushes at the end of all the vine, all the rose. Oh, that's right. And we found out it's because it's, Gabbiano is great because they're starting to establish um, like a natural way of keeping their nutrient a certain level in the soil in the so soil. that they don't have yeah. to spray. Yep. Which has to do with like your nitrogen content. It was really interesting to talk to the, one of the vineyard managers there because we got to ask him some pretty cool questions about like their new practices they're trying to put into place so that they're yep. like sustainable and. It was interesting to talk to him about the rose bushes and why they used them there in comparison to Oregon. They use them um, to show pests, but it, that's not the same in Chianti. Chianti, it was for the soil content and it yeah, was for so something else. If the roses don't bloom or something happens with the rose bush because it blooms and flowers earlier than grapes do yep. you know that you have a problem with the soil in that area yeah it was just so interesting Fascinating. like how how in italy and oregon two different climates two totally different wines yeah they're using the same yeah. plant to kind of show them different things of what's happening for sure it's crazy it's crazy <sighs> it, it just was like mind. the most fun little nugget facts like at every turn <laughs> which is why I'm a super wine nerd and that was a fun trip because we got to yeah. literally get on our hands and knees and like we went out play in the, the vi- dirt yeah we went out into the <laughs> vineyard we went all through the um, winemaking facility and then we had this really great tasting event out in there oh that cute little lawn yeah that speaking of cute things that gentleman that gave us the tour oh he was a he was delightful. He was one of the winemakers. <laughs> yeah, he was one of the winemakers, and he was very good looking. Yeah, and for being, and what was really interesting is Gabbiano. I feel like is such a a staple in grocery stores, mm-hmm. and it's yeah, very you can it's, find it. It's everywhere. affordable. This was a ten dollar bottle of wine, mm-hmm. and it's delicious. It is delicious. It's delicious. Gabbiano like, is the. I'm sure you. You will all know exactly what we're talking about because it has the shield on it with the knight. Yeah, with the knight on the horse. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. it's very classy. 
I feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was one of those interesting, you got to see where this wine was made. Yeah. You got to see everything, their whole facility. It was it and but really then also great. to see the vineyards that they're sourcing their grapes from and how they're mm-hmm. really big on, you know, like natural management. And it yeah. makes me feel better about a larger production size of wine. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, they're a very, very large producing facility. A lot of it goes overseas and. But their grounds are gorgeous. Their vineyards are impeccable. Yeah. They're very sustainable. It was a, that was a big conversation about yeah. how sustainable they were. Yeah. That was kind of a lot of a lot of things that we got to do on this trip was talk to people about sustainability. Yeah, and it was surprising to me how many I mean, it shouldn't be, but it was surprising to me how many winemakers throughout the whole two weeks that we were there that's what they wanted to talk about was how sustainable, you know, we have Well, because I feel like it's a it's a return to a much more natural way of making wine like people used to do it. Yeah. You know, I feel mm-hmm. like you had this influx of, oh, we have a we have a much um more accessible market and so we need to make things shelf stable we need to make things appeal to a certain type of person who's going to buy it Mm -hmm. right like Mm -hmm. we have to tweak Mm -hmm. the the actual content that we're drinking Mm -hmm. which i don't approve of (laughs) because i don't want no franken wine i don't want franken wine either but this this facility was great and we had a great time there and this this wine is amazing yeah there's no reason that delicious wine should cost you an arm and a leg this is a great Mm -hmm. make some pasta oh yeah I mean, mine was uh, 25 bucks, the yeah. Reserva. Yeah. And yours was what? 15? 10, 10? 12. Yeah. So we're right in the... I think I got a little discount because I'm a QFC <laughs> card carrying member. <laughs> hey, man, fuel points. Serious business. Gas yeah, is expensive. Absolutely. You want to give me 30 cents off a gallon? Done. I'll I'm take, not even... I'll take yeah. those savings. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will take them to the bank. All to the, the bank. Yeah, this, this is, is tasty. 10, like to, this. 10 to $25 for a bottle. I think this other thing I like about Chianti is that it's not, it's like just the right amount of dry and just the right amount of fruit and really food friendly. And you can, you can have it with a lot of things. I think Sangiovese in general is a great grape and is uh, really quite food friendly. Right. Now you go out to Brunello de Montalcino and that shit Ooh. is heavy. That's, that's pretty, I mean, now, I mean, yeah, that's pretty, that is heavy. I mean, oh, delicious, heavy, but. You know, big bodied. Can we talk about Super Tuscan? So what the difference is between these county classicos that we're drinking? Oh yeah. So I feel like Super Tuscan is is a interesting take a sip. Don't stop. Oh, drinking. sorry, you just got I me know. going. I I, and, you're like, oh, you asked me a question, I'm gonna talk about the answer because I have the research <laughs> and it's right here and it's ready to go. You want me to go? I've got my nose pulled up. They're pulled up. <laughs> take a breath, Redden. <laughs> Cheers. You're the county. I get, ex- to my heart. I get excited. <laughs> I'm not sorry. Mm-hmm. I need to stop apologizing for getting excited about things. Don't apologize. You didn't do anything wrong. I mean, a Catholic, so I can't help good. it. It's so good. I, you know, here's two things. One, I'm going to buy more Chianti and I'm going to buy more Rioja because the wines are so good. Well, and they age well because they have such a mandate on oak. I mean, it's the same with Brunello because they have to yeah. spend much, much more time in oak. And the soil up in Brunello was totally different than, than yeah, Chianti. Yeah, it was totally but, um, different. We had some we had some good Brunellos. They're real they're just real heavy. You just have to have the right stuff with them. Yeah, yeah. Versus I feel like Chianti you can just drink. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. For ten to fifteen dollars, yeah. both of these could have sat in the cellar for another three or four years and it would have been fine. Mm. Yeah, I'd say that's about like a decent average time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're just gonna get better. Yeah. Because they're because you're starting with quality fruit, right? When you have that that really delineated um I think it's amazing you can buy a ten rule structure, right? Like ten to fifteen dollar bottle of wine and put it in your cellar for three years. Like that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's good shit, man. That's what happens when you treat your wine like a food product. Right? One of the things that Europe's getting right. <laughs> I have issues with some of their airports, but that's neither here nor there. I still want to go to Europe, so I don't want to like point fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious like I, we were just talking about this I was curious if I could be a, I, if I could move to France as a refugee <laughs> uh, you have way better food please take me in <laughs> you don't regulate your cheese yeah. 
<laughs> Your wine is so good. Can you just just take me? Just take me. All right. So super <laughs> Tuscans. Super so, Tuscans. So this is so okay. San so Giovese. let's just say. <laughs> hold that thought. I just cut you off, and I apologize. <laughs> Don't apologize. I'm the one that interrupted. So San Giovese. Hold that thought. What do you think of when I say super Tuscan? <laughs> I think of like if you had to define a super Tuscan, how would you define it? Well, see, that's a hard question because uh, I wouldn't define the wine. I would define the people who drink the wine, and so I'm not really interested. Um, because it became popular for a while, you know where I'm going with yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But if if I say what is a super Tuscan, what do you say? Um, what are we having for dinner? That's no, no. Heavy, big, like I, I wouldn't normally buy a Super Tuscan as a purchaser of wine. Okay, but it's just because it is a little bit too much for right. me. Anything, it's like anything in its name that has super in it. I kind of. <laughs> You're I'm trying to make me off. be impressed, and that's making me actually <laughs> yeah. do the opposite. Right, like. Uh, okay, so right. Super Tuscan is a term used to describe red wines from Tuscany that may include the use of non-indigenous grapes. So things like Merlot, mm-hmm. Cab Sauv, okay. Syrah. So non-indigenous to the area. Right, because they're French grapes. And they San Giovese is indigenous to Italy. <sighs> yeah. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things indigenous to Italy that didn't go nowhere. Super Tuscan. It kind of like, it kind of makes me, (laughs) yeah. So the (laughs) Crete. Don't try to impress me with your super duper name. Okay. (laughs) Why can't you just be Tuscan? Right? Why can't you find a different name? Find like Tuscan Plus or. Oh, that's not better. (laughs) No, it's not better. (laughs) That's not better. So the creation of the super Tuscan (laughs) wine was a result because there was a big frustration with winemakers. Um, slow bureaucracy in terms of changing wine laws in the 70s so (laughs) we're making good wine but you won't let us use this area because we're not Chianti or Chianti Classico or Chianti Classico Reserve right we want to do our own thing we want it there's these other things that we can grow here that grow well Mm -hmm. we want to be able to blend them into our wines why can't we fuck you guys we're going to make our own club so so they got of away from the Black Rooster Syndicate and yeah, they so made they, their own little club. So they started using they were they were considered unsanctioned varietals. <laughs> <laughs> it's you literally are, what the research you are says. Excommunicated from wine, the wine club. This is this is the direct quote. Winemakers began mixing quote unsanctioned and quote wine varieties <laughs> like Merlot into their blends to make high quality wines. The legal system eventually yielded in 1992 with the creation of an IGT, a new designation that gives winemakers the ability to be more creative. So this literally brought about the change of elevating this like IGT status of essentially we'll let you call it this thing but in other like in France like that is like table wine where you don't have any restrictions but it's still of quality <laughs> right so it's kind of a it's kind of a a, a bitch slap but uh, uh yeah you know what I mean it's a pretentious bit, bitch slap well, kind of I mean yeah they're the people that make the rules that's why they were like we're really frustrated you're a slow bureaucratic process and you're not adapting to how things are changing so it's it's sangiovese and merlot and or cab and or is it and that's a super tuscan yeah so the phrase was really kind the the term super tuscan really started coming about in the 80s so like the concept (laughs) had already started but then it got they put a name on it a little bit later yeah um, so, that name is bad. Yeah. So James Suckling, the famous oh, yeah. wine critic, mm-hmm. um, said that the term may have originated in... Um, Our buddy that's in Hong Kong. Hey, girl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he said that it may have come from a number of sources, including um, a really famous winemaker, Luigi Veronelli, who was uh, an Italian food and wine writer. I'm sorry, he's not a winemaker. That was my, my bad. Um, or someone else who may have said it. He was, uh, his name was Burton Anderson. He was a writer who moved to Tuscany in 1977. 
uh, to write about its bright future. Or it could have been David Gleave, a master of wine and one of the UK's leading wine experts in Italy. So no one's really sure where the term comes from, but Super Tuscan. it started to get thrown around when all of these people were kind of heavy hitters talking about this style of wine. So they kind really of needed somebody with them that is a marketing genius because Super Tuscan is the worst name. Yeah, in the world. yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. Because it it kind of makes me uh, here. This is my this is where I get caught up. It makes me think of a particular consumer of wine. Yeah. And that consumer of wine is not me. It's that's you know, fine. Older like. male yeah. with a mustache. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's like the little biddies who want their, you know, California Chardonnay or that's the people right. who are like, I want the sweetest Riesling you have. Yeah. Or like, it's just, I feel like people stuck in a rut of, oh, this became fashionable at a point and I've never moved on from that. Yeah. Which You're is right. fine. You're right. That's absolutely true. I mean, it's acceptable. You like what you like. And if you don't want to try new things, like you're just missing out. More wine for me. <laughs> I think you should try new things, but I think you should also like stick with what you like. No, you know what? Don't try new things ever. Just stick with what you like and then leave more wine for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you always bring two bottles. So there's always... Yeah, there's always two things I'll to try. I'll have the thing I know I like and yep. here's something that you can have that might be delicious. Maybe. But I've got the thing I like. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> I know what I'm And drinking. I want it to be a super task. <laughs> uh, so the very first, essentially, or rather one of the most famous um, super Tuscans was actually created by Antonori in 1971. And it was the one of the first super Tuscans. And today it's a blend of 80% Sangiovese, 15% Cab Sauv, and 5% Cab Franc. This bottle now goes for about $80 a pop. Wow. Yeah. But you can, I mean, you can that's, find them you know for, from anywhere so from like 18 to $80. Like it's people making them now. Like it's good fruit. Like it's solid shit. Yeah. Fruit. Sangiovese. And other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they created their own. Um, Do you have any information about um, where Sangiovese come, comes from? Like the mom and dad? I didn't, but I can. <laughs> do you want to tell a story while I do a quick spot of on on the minute research? Well, it would just be a story about our trip to Italy that I want to go back and do. Well, we're just reliving it, and let's keep reliving it. So, you remember, do you remember when we went to the um, restaurant in Florence called Sabatini? Sabatini. Yes, our where friends they light things on fire, and their wine list was amazing. Sent from heaven. Yeah, their oh, wine was list so was sent from heaven, and they knew, and they have table side service. So we're there, and <laughs> they did the steaks table side. Yeah, yeah, big flambe. It was so, it was so amazing. And they have, when they were building out the restaurant, they were down in the cellar, and they found from like thir- the mid thirteen hundreds, they found the blueprints of the restaurant. Yes, when they were building, well, the building that they're in the building of the restaurant they right. found the blueprints for and it's hanging on the wall it was so beautiful there they had a beautiful indoor garden if you're first of all you have to go to italy second you have to go to florence third you have to go to sabatini it's very affordable the wine list is amazing the food is so good it was so good that in the four days we were there three days we were in florence for three days three days that we were there i ate dinner there two of those three days it was so good. It was delicious. And I like trying everything, so. That was the first night we were in Italy. Yeah. Anyway, I found your information. That I was answered my story. your question. <laughs> um, so, recent DNA profiling by Jose Vuyamos at the Institute Agrio di San I'm not even going to try yeah, because I would just be doing it a disservice suggest. So the, the information that they found suggests that Sangiovese's ancestors are, uh, Chilagrio, Chilagrigolo and, uh, Calabrese Monte Nuovo, not Mon- Monte Nuovo. Hmm. Once more for the kids in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Tip your waiter. Calabrese Monte Nuovo. And Kilagrilio. Kilagriliolo. Shit. <laughs> hey, I don't speak Italian. I'm trying. That's so I'm sure one of those G's is probably silent and Yeah, probably. A thing. 
Uh, so the former, so the. Do you think it's on your like wine geneal- geneal- genealogy? Probably. I'll thing. try and find a picture of it. I'll take okay. a, or I'll, I'll take a picture <laughs> and I can post it. Uh, so the former is known as a ancient varietal in Tuscany, the Chilla Grigliolo. Um, and the latter, the Calabrese, is an almost extinct relic from uh, the Calabria region, which is the toe of the boot. Mm. At least 14 Sangiovese clones exist, of which Brunello is one of the best regarded. An attempt to classify the clones in Sangiovese Grosso, including Brunello and Sangiovese Piccolo families, has gained little evidential support. Young... Oh, well, let's just talk about the aromatics. Anyway, yeah, those are its parents. Interesting. Italy's weird because it's a lot of things that have gone extinct or things mm-hmm. that are uh, really very regional and didn't ever get any widespread outside of like the outside town. of Italy or the town or whatever. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of cross contamination. No, and so that's why when we were in um, up in the Veneto, we met Luca, who mm-hmm. is one of like he's growing. Um, a scrape tie that is allowed in two areas up there and yeah. nowhere else. And it's almost extinct. Nowhere and else in the we world. We saw 15,000 yeah. starts. Yeah, that's his, right. I have a greenhouse. picture of that. And um, he was telling us all about like. It used to be called Tokay. And then they had to change the name because of a, a legal battle with Hungary. Yep. But it's been known colloquially as something else for a long time. But mm-hmm. now it's just. T- and it was just T-A-I, him. T-A-I, Tay, Tai. Tai, something like that. Him and another grower. Yeah. It, that was really incredible. Yeah. He was here at the Vancouver Wine Festival. Oh, was he really? Yeah. We could have seen him? I think we, I think I pointed him out and we were just really overwhelmed with the crowd at that point. Oh, probably. And, and if you go to these wine festivals and you want to talk to the people, it's hard because there's always a line of people that For want sure. to talk to the people. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. You are the Chianti to my heart. The Chianti to my heart. Yeah, Chianti's fun. It's a it's a really great region. Um, if you get super geeky, there's different areas for different. That's like the Coley. Let me see if I can find. Uh, if you want to see all of Brandon's notes, which he does extensive note taking and he cites his sources, you can go to our website www.casualwinegeeks.com dot com and sign up to be a sponsor of this podcast through Patreon. Thanks, Patreon. We have we'll send you a whole bunch of merch if you sign up, like a yep. bunch of free stuff. Yep, yep, yep. We have a whole stack of stuff. It's going to go out very, very soon. Watch. Do your you mail. like Gold Lame? I like Gold Lame. <laughs> Who doesn't like a Gold Lame wine bag? Yeah. That's all I'm saying. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. Yeah. Uh, but all of our notes are posted on Patreon. And whatever level you sign up for, you get the notes, extra, extras. There's hidden episodes. I had the question, why did your podcast start on number two? Because the first, very, very first podcast that we did, we put on Patreon. So you can't listen to it unless you're a Patreon member. Uh-huh. <laughs> it was rough. <laughs> Hilarious, but also... A little rough. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> which one? Which, was it the rose? Yes, way rose. Was that? Oh, it might have been. And we also have the joints and juice one. It was. Oh yeah, the joints episode. and juice. Ugh, yeah, that one was that rough. Was a rough. <laughs> <laughs> There's two or three episodes on. Just on because Patreon. you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> All right, so. I don't, I don't know what else you looked so, weren't you looking something up oh I was just looking up the like different hills in the Chianti area if you want to get like super geeky uh, so it's like you have Chianti the area the area yep and then Chianti Classico right and then within Chianti Classico is where you can also do the Reserva yep and then you get real specific with Chianti Coli Fiorentini so it's this hill Coli means hill mm-hmm um, these hills around Florence. So it's right. Oh, cool. Can we put the map on Patreon? Yeah, it's in my notes. Okay. Um, and it's actually color coded because I have problems with blues and greens because I'm colorblind. <laughs> um, so everything shows up in shades of red. Yeah. So what I like about this is that it's all shades of reds and pinks. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier for me to see. <laughs> hey, sometimes that. the research is because it's easy for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's really. Because you want to know why? Because this podcast, it's all. About oh, it's what my we podcast. Want. Yep, it's not yours. <laughs> I mean, it's ours. <laughs> no, we talk about whatever we want because uh, we can. Yeah, so it's interesting if you want to get like super specific in terms of like the different real 
real focused in areas in Chianti, you can for sure. Um, uh, I think that would be the same for but like that, that's, any wine region, right? Like in general. Right. So that's like, that's like saying I want wine from this specific like the Ob. vineyard in Burgundy. Oh yeah. Because or I want it from, or from like a specific row or mm, specific whatever. Yeah. yeah. You, I mean, Burgundy is a great example. You can get r- as, as specific as you can. Yeah. And it's, and it all has to come down to like, we can prove that we have a different climate. We can prove that our winemaking style is different. We can prove that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. everything about our regulations are going to set us apart as a product from everything around us. Yeah. And we're going to set up this consortium <laughs> or what do you call them? A syndicate syndicate. It's not the fucking mob. <laughs> it's always the mob. <laughs> I, I like the name syndicate conspiracy theory McGee over here. It's I'm not calling it the mob. I'm calling it a syndicate. I think that's more connotation. Is that connotation than actual definition S- syndicate? I'll look it up next time. It's it. They have nefarious goings on is all I have to say. You can't tell me that all these groups of people don't have their own agenda, right? Like, of course they do. It's It's a a syndicate. It's a marketing ploy. Yeah, it's a marketing ploy. It's a syndicate. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I want to be in charge of a syndicate. I I, would be terrible. No, let's do it right now. The casual wine geek syndicate. Yes. (laughs) You want to be in? Can we be a a wine (laughs) decade? (laughs) <laughs> Only if I can refer to us as a syndicate, because that's apparently the big thing. Okay. I yeah. mean, I'm into that. Perfect. Awesome. awesome. We have a casual wine geek syndicate. We have to come up with rules now. Oh, shit. <laughs> I know, Maybe that's, next week. <laughs> that's where we're going to get stuck. I didn't know there was going to be homework. God damn it. Mm. Now we're a part of the, we've been baptized in the, in the Black Rooster Syndicate today. I don't want to pigeonhole myself into just like drinking Chianti though. Well, just because you've been baptized in this syndicate doesn't mean you can't be a member of another syndicate. Yeah, it's getting too complicated. <laughs> I just want to drink the goddamn wine and talk about it. Yeah. Well, that's all I have to say. The black rooster. That's all I have to say. It's so interesting. Yeah. Wine is cool. Yeah. Well, Chianti's fun. Cause it was, it was such a like, you know, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, who was one of the Medici's, like, set up the rules for here's how you have to be able to, what you can make, rather, what you can grow to make this wine in this area to call it this thing. So that was kind of the beginning. That was in 1398. Did you ever see that Netflix series on the... Oh, I'm sorry. 1716. On the Medici's? 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 There's a whole Netflix series on the family. And after being in Florence and spending so much time in Italy, it was so interesting to be in those places that they're oh, now yeah, yeah, yeah. Portra- portraying on the... For sure. Yeah. You're like, oh, I know all about that thing. Yeah. I was in that room. I saw this. I watched... You know, we were in a lot of the museums where they did a lot of video documentary style about the family because it was so influential in Florence. That was a really great um, series. Yeah. They didn't talk about... Chianti, but still, if you're into Italy, that would be a, you know, if you're going to Italy, which you should, everybody should go. <laughs> do it. Taste the wine. Do it. Do it. Do it. It is so good. Yeah. What else you got? Anything fun? I don't know. There's just, it's all, no. <laughs> <laughs> it gets into, it gets like into the geeky, like, well, at this time period, this was the designated recipe of making Chianti and then it changed Great. because of this thing. And Perfect. We'll, we'll tease the Patreon. People sign up. Yeah. I mean, thanks Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> it's all cited. Copy paste, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey, it's, it's like, I don't have to sit in the library and go through um, films of microfish anymore. Oh my God. Could you imagine? Did you ever have to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Are we you kidding too. me? I had to learn Latin to Talk write Talk about before dissertation. the internet was around. Gah. Oh, I remember you telling me about having to learn Latin. Yeah, because we didn't have the internet. So so when I did my dissertation in college, I went to the actual library to the old like ancient text room and I had to learn Latin because all of my original material referenced these books what did those books smell like? Oh, it was amazing because it was in its own room. Right. Right. So the room smelled cool. It was, and you had to sat, sit at a specific desk and you didn't have a cell phone, so you couldn't take a picture. So you had to 
write out what you thought was a reference piece of material, make sure that that was translated correctly, or you had, you know, all your books around you open so you could translate each word. It was, it was rough. (laughs) That's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Six months of my life was spent in that library. That's crazy. Huh? It was crazy. Huh? Did I ever tell you what it was on? Your dissertation? Yeah. Mm, it's applicable. It was a history thing, right? It was, it was, yeah, it was history. My, yeah, it's applicable to the conversation, which is the only reason I bring it up. Was applicable it about today. the Medici's? No, it was about the Emperor Nero. Oh, yeah. Which I, I mean, knew it was history, but I don't think yeah. I knew it was Nero. Nero in Rome, because that's which where is we very met close. was wine history. Yeah, yeah, the Emperor Nero. Did he actually fiddle while Rome burned? <laughs> I mean, I know the answer, but... If you want to watch the movie, yes. <laughs> However, movies are not fact. Movies are not fact. They're, yeah, it was really super interesting. It was probably the hardest thing that I've ever done and the most satisfying thing. Well, and I feel like with something like that, you would have to know so much pre Nero dynasty. Yeah. Because a lot of things led up to a lot of things that led up to a lot of things yep. that culminated in this one event, right? Yep. It's not... In original text. Yeah. You have to have so much backstory before you can get to yeah, and then getting through what you're trying to get through for what you're trying to talk about, right? Like, which I feel like is the same with wine. Yeah. Knowing that, well, in this area, this is how it was done in the 1300s. And then, you know, it changed with this duchy swapping hands and doing this thing and deciding mm-hmm. that, you know, Dukes mm-hmm. of Burgundy, like, we're going to start fucking shit up because we can yeah. You know, no more Gamay. Get rid of that Elgote. Move that Chardonnay <laughs> over there. I'm a Duke with a fluffy hat. Yep. Do and as this I is say. what I want. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, I, I don't know. It's it, so crazy. I love wine history because it's it's tied to economics. It's tied to religion. It's tied to... It's tied to everything. Geography. Absolutely everything. It's tied to... Politics. Yep, and yeah. For sure. Wine is the expression, I think, of our lives. And it's, it's history in a bottle. Yeah. You know, it's weather. Mm-hmm. It's climate everything it's land use it's Mm -hmm. uh yeah it's like a time capsule Mm -hmm. fascinating (laughs) tell me more (laughs) and then this one time in (laughs) italy (laughs) yeah i don't know chianti get it eat it drink it with yeah it with pasta try it i mean if you're a big like cab california cab fan for fifteen dollars, that you you're like, I get a California cab for fifteen dollars. Break out of your box and get yourself a Chianti Classico for fifteen dollars. Yeah, there's enough fruit. There's I think enough, you're going to be surprised if you like a cab. There's enough um, tannin, like there's yeah. enough structure. Yep. Mm-hmm. But it's it's not as oak driven, which is I think what I like. And the acid. So here's the thing with Italian wines: the acid is on point because it is always served with food. And the food there, yeah, the food there is what salty meat, pasta, and cheese. Yeah, really, like think about a wine that's going to go great with a charcuterie plate. This is going to be great. Yeah, salted meat, cheese, pasta. Oh, I know. <laughs> Take me back. <laughs> we made ha- we made um, handmade pasta and pesto, and you found those recipes. Yeah, that's the pesto I made you the other day. Is that recipe that we had in Italy. Chocolate orange. Like like a chocolate orange cake. Cake. Yeah. Handmade pasta and pesto and chocolate orange. Oh, we got yelled at by an Italian chef. Amazing. It was was so great. It was like my dream come true. (laughs) (laughs) I feel legitimate now. (laughs) Maybe I'll try and post that picture of of you making pasta. Oh, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. That was such a great trip. It's time to go back to Italy. Yeah. Let's let's go. Do it. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks thanks for listening. For listening. <laughs> You're all amazing for sticking around. We're back. We're here. We're present. We're recording once again. We have presents going out in the mail. Keep your eyes open. And we love you. And always take two bottles. Bye. Ciao.